The beauty of the Nikki Haley for President campaign is that it's a national Rorschach blot. If you have any interest at all in the condition of the United States or its future, obviously you are passionately, by definition, opposed to Nikki Haley becoming president because she has no interest in the United States or its future. But if you are completely bought in to the class of people who currently run the country and who are running it into the ground, then you're all in a Nikki Haley because she's, in effect, your puppet. So it's really interesting to see people's reaction to this campaign, and most telling of all, Pretty much every permanent fixture in Washington is either supportive of Nikki Haley or isn't saying anything about it. And that brings us to our next guest. He is Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. And as he assessed the presidential race, his reaction was the following. This is a paraphrase, but it's basically what he said. He said, I'm not exactly sure who I'm for. I know very well who I'm against. I'm against Nikki Haley. So against Nikki Haley that on principle, not personal, that he announced a new movement called Never Nikki. Here's, here it is. So I'm announcing this morning that I'm Never Nikki. And if you go to nevernikki.net, you can let her know that you're not a supporter either. I don't think any informed or knowledgeable libertarian or conservative should support Nikki Haley. I've seen her attitude towards our, invent, our interventions overseas. I've seen her involvement in the military industrial complex. $8 million being paid to become part of the team. But I've also seen her indicate that she thinks you should be registered to use the internet, that people posting ideas anonymously. I think she fails to understand that our republic was founded upon people like Ben Franklin, Sam Adams, Madison, John Jay, and others who posted routinely for fear of the government. They posted routinely anonymously. So I'm announcing today I'm Never Nikki. You can go to nevernikki.net and sign up and show her that you're Never Nikki also. So it's one thing to find Nikki Haley distasteful to acknowledge that she's a bloodthirsty feminist harpy who should be nowhere near power. Most reasonable people have reached that conclusion. But to start a website, Never Nikki, suggests a level of anti-Nikki commitment that's interesting and worth talking about. Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky joins us now. Senator, thanks so much for coming on. So let's start at the end. What what moved well, you? you. I, don't, I don't think you're being paid to do this. You're not getting you know extra <laughs> points. You're already a U.S. senator. Why, why were you so inflamed by her campaign that you built this website? Well, you know, never nobody ever accused me of going halfway into anything. Fair. And it really it gets to me at a, at a very basic level. It gets to me when I see people who I think care more about the borders of Ukraine than they care about our own southern border. And I see these people every day because they're the entire Democrat caucus up here, but they're half of my caucus. Half of my yes. Republican caucus is, as we speak, ready to sell out, and they're ready to sell out fake border reform in exchange for what they really want, which is to send more of your tax dollars to Ukraine. I think Nikki Haley fits right in that camp. I think she's from the, she's from the McConnell, Dick Cheney wing of the party. And this is the antithesis of everything I believe in. I've spent uh, a few years trying to promote the ideas of liberty. There is a wing of the party that believes in that. And I want to make sure anybody that follows the, the, what I do knows that there's no way, shape or form I could support Nikki Haley. So obviously you're not increasing your contributions from the defense industry by attacking Nikki Haley. So I'm, I'm just guessing Raytheon's not paying you to do this. They're on her side. <laughs> yeah. So it's purely a passion project for you. Yeah, and I think there are some things out there, and I've heard this both from uh, people like Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, as well as from McConnell's and others. Their argument, and it's similar to Nikki Haley's argument, is that war is good for our armaments industries. These are U.S. corporations, and this makes U.S. powerful to have these corporations uh, have larger profits. And so really, they extol war uh, with no concern, really. And I know it's not American soldiers, but people are dying over there. And yeah. By many estimates, well over 100,000 people have died. But to justify that, to say it makes our armaments industry stronger and the fact that Nikki Haley worked in that armaments industry, I find it a despicable argument, an inhumane sort of unreal argument that people would argue that corporate profits for arms merchants is something that we should justify war over. And it just gets to me. I, ju I just think it's a reprehensible argument. I told Anthony Blinken that. I've told others that, that this is something that, you know, it's one thing to say. I, I told him, I don't think it was Blinken. It was uh, one of his underlings the last time in a committee. I said, 
try to go back to the liberation argument, at least talk about someone's freedom instead of talking about the profits that this will bring to U.S. arms merchants. They got mad at me, but, you know, somebody's got to say it. Well, I mean, as an American, a patriotic American, you want to believe that your country is a force for good. But the argument you just described is so disgusting and so completely immoral that it's hard to believe your country is if it's being led by people who want to have want to kill others for the sake of enriching the people who make weapons of mass destruction. What did they say when you raised that? Were they ashamed? You know, they're taken aback that someone uh, dares to challenge them. Uh, but they will retreat into some sort of liberation argument of this is best for freedom. But I guess when I look at the situation over there, I think the longer one, I think it makes our national security more vulnerable the more we go into debt. And I think debt's the number one threat. And yes. another 60 billion is a significant amount of money. We've already sent 100 billion over there. I don't think there's sufficient oversight in it. But I also think the longer we send money, the less likely there is to be a negotiated settlement. So it will mean thousands of more lives lost. It's not that I'm insensitive to the war. I actually am very sensitive to people dying on both sides. I'm not sympathetic to Russia. Russia invaded. They're the aggressor. My sympathies are with Ukraine. But at the same time, I think Russia occupies a portion that they're not giving up. And Ukraine does not have the ability to remove them from eastern Ukraine. The commander in chief of the Ukraine army said recently it's a stalemate. Zelensky's everywhere around the world. He's got time to be in Vogue magazine, him and his wife. He also has time to jet off to Argentina. And look, I'm fascinated by the new president of Argentina. I'd like to go too. But if I were in the middle of a war, I would think it might not be the best time to go to a post-election party all the way halfway across the world. But Zelensky, I really think that there are other problems here too. You know, if people talk about whether or not our aid should be conditioned, well, you'd think they talk so much about democracy, maybe it ought to be conditioned on that the country receiving the aid ought to have elections. You know, there are no presidential elections. They've been canceled. There are no scheduled elections in Ukraine. There also are accusations of oligarchs or wealthy people that have taken over state industries that are profiting directly by this. Some of our money's going to like, it was going to, there was a, I think 60 Minutes showed like a, a, a women's bags, you know, a clothing and bag store getting grants from us, like small business loans to Ukraine. We're paying for their, their government workers. We're paying for their pensions, for goodness sakes. But this is something that Nikki Haley is all in on. And clearly the rest of the pack has separated themselves from her on this. And so it, it's a real division in the party. It's not a made up, it's not brand new. It's not Nikki Haley being brand new, but she's clearly in the, the, the McCain, Dick Cheney, uh, McConnell camp. These are the big government Republicans. These are the people who never met a war they didn't love to be involved with. And they somehow think they're going to make the world or remake the world in our image. And they fail to, I think, acknowledge failure after failure after failure. And uh, but I don't I don't want a president, Republican or Democrat, from that wing of the party. So you noted that there are no scheduled presidential elections in Ukraine. There are scheduled presidential elections in Russia. Sorry, that's just a fact. We know that Ukraine has banned a Christian denomination. Russia has not. Uh, okay. So at that point, you sort of wonder, like, all this liberation talk that we heard at the beginning, we're on the side of democracy against dictatorship. We're on the side of the country that banned a Christian denomination and canceled elections. Clearly, we're not on the side of democracy, obviously. So was it always about the money, do you think? Like, what is this exactly? What was the motive that drove our leaders to destroy, you know, the global economy. You know, the thing, it, it, it's somewhat perplexing. Team now use Weep, but I still have a few friends that are on the fence about getting on board. And what I hear from some of those friends is that they're a little bit worried about what they might see in the data and they might feel uncomfortable about knowing what's going on inside their body. If I've learned anything, it is that knowledge is power. And once I finally started to look at the data and understand how getting less sleep was affecting my body and how my old lifestyle was actually hurting my long-term health, everything changed for the better. So if this is something that you'd like to try out, head over to join.whoop.com slash CEO and you'll get to try Whoop for 30 days, risk-free with zero commitment. Try it and let me know how you get on. I was looking at our past conversation and I thought it would be interesting to see who the audience were, their, their demographic. And the, the age group were 20 to 40 year olds, really 18 to 40 year olds. My question to you is, 
in their lives, in that demographic's lives, what do you think the biggest challenge is? Because your both your kids, Julian and Michaela, both fit into that that category as well. What is the greatest challenge that that demographic face? Well, the biggest challenges we had with our kids was, see, I think the biggest challenge I had in my generation was negotiating the years between 13 and 15, something like that. But my sense is now the biggest challenge to young people is negotiating the transition into adulthood, into adulthood identity. And I think that's partly why we have this terrible war in our culture about what constitutes identity. And I think the reason that identity has become such a problem is that our concepts of identity are unbelievably unsophisticated, narrow, hedonistic, and self-serving. So the identity groups that have popped up are all, you could say, whim-based identity groups. They're sexual identity, say, or something arbitrary like sex, like se sex or race or ethnicity, something arbitrary. But the sexual identity groups are particularly interesting because the idea that that's your identity is predicated on the notion that there isn't anything more vital to you than your than the immediacy of your sexual behavior. Well, you're not a sex machine. You're not a short-term sex machine. That's not what a human being is. So if you revert to that, all you're going to do is produce like anxiety, hopelessness, and misery. It's not a good solution. So then you might say, well, what's the solution? And the solution is something called a subsidiary solution. It's like, so what's your identity? Well, you should get your act together and take care of yourself. So you have to integrate yourself. You have to integrate across anxiety and hatred and pain and jealousy and fear and hunger and lust and all the, that, that plethora of spirits that wage war within you. It's a and lot. It's a lot. You have to bring that into a unity, okay? And one of the things Nietzsche said, the famous German philosopher, was that every drive attempts to philosophize in its spirit. So all those subsidiary, sub subordinate spirits that war inside you will try to dominate. I'm only my anger I'm, or rage. That's the protester type, you know? I'm only my sexuality. I'm only my, my, ap my appetite. That's the consumer model. But all that has to be integrated. And then you might say, well, integrated into what? Well, integrated into a structure that serves all of those spirits simultaneously and harmoniously across a long time. That's maturity. Okay, but that doesn't happen in isolation. So then the next, there's stages above that. Okay, so the next thing is, maybe you've got your act together enough so that someone can tolerate being around you. So that, so there's enough left over from you so you can play with someone else. So you establish a relationship, marriage, let's say. You invite someone else to join forces with you. You produce a united vision. Okay, so now there's you and there's you as husband. And it's the joint interplay of those that's now your identity. Okay, and so now you have a role and you have obligations and responsibilities and opportunities. You know, you say, well, I'm constrained by my marriage. You know, there's all sorts of things I can't do, which really means I can no longer, in the most primitive way, it means I can no longer immediately gratify my short-term whims. Although it could also be more complex in that I don't get to pursue the things that I need to pursue, which means you haven't negotiated with your wife very well. Mm -hmm. Like if your marriage is a prison, you have, you're either very immature in what you want or you haven't negotiated properly. If you've done it well, you've got your individual unity established, and then there's a unity within the marriage that's better. And why would it be better? Well, you could learn to love someone, mm. and that would be better, because getting outside yourself decreases your anxiety. So we know as psychologists, one of the things that was learned 20 years ago is that there's no difference between thinking about yourself and what you want and being miserable. Those are self-consciousness and negative emotion are so tightly tied together that they're statistically indistinguishable. Does that not raise the question about the decline of religion? A absolutely. Well, that's the next level. It's like, okay, so there's you, now you're a husband, right? And so your identity is those two things in lockstep. But that's not enough. Now maybe you're a father. Now you have kids. Now you have a whole other level of responsibility and opportunity to flesh yourself out and support and love, right? So now... And then, well, 
you so you've got your family th together that's not enough you've got the community to serve so you want to serve the community and then community scale you know maybe you're good in your local business and you have a local business organization and you're good in that and then well then there's the town level and the city level and the state level and the country level and then you know america is one nation under god that's the ultimate level of this hierarchy of identity and that's what should be served most fundamentally that's a definition okay god is that which should be served most fundamentally it's a definition so when you're thinking that b is better than a what you're saying even if you don't know it is that b is a step from a on the road to god that's what you're saying the, the medieval definition a medieval definition of god was something like the sum of all that is good or the essence of what is good and so if you believe that there is a good then lurking behind that is the spirit of all that which all which all of that which is good that's God by definition. Now, you can debate forever about what that is, but it is something you live in relationship to. Like that's inescapable. That's absolutely inescapable. And you might say, well, I don't believe in God. And then I would say, well, do you believe in good? And you'll say, no. I say, well, then you can't act because you act towards a good or you're not motivated. I called a Simon Gunning, who's the CEO of Campaign of Living Miserably. It's a big mental health charity here. And I said, give me the updated stats. He said to me, 19 to 35 year olds, which is that demographic that are listening to this predominantly, um, are twice as likely to report being in crisis than any other group. Right. And the re there's a reason. For, it's a very straightforward reason. It's, it's literally this. The more you are focused on yourself, the more miserable you are. It's, it's as simple as that. But that's society now these days. We're very I know. Well, and we're in well, and there are terrible forces pushing us in that direction. You know, like I could attribute this to the idiocies of a degenerate Protestant liberalism driven by postmodernism. But you could also just as easily point to consumerist capitalism. It's like it's all about you. It's all about what you want. Worse, it's all about what you want right now. Worse, it's all about what your basest appetites want, regardless of cost, right now. Well, that, that's the same as being two years old. It's, there's nothing about that that's... And why do you think that's you anyways? It's like, since when did what you are become what the most idiotic part of you who cares nothing about anything else and any other people wants right now? Why is that you? How about this though? So this is where I'm trying to make a distinction is responsibility is a good thing. But with responsibility, sometimes comes the... 